Good evening. I'm Kat Powers, and we're here for a virtual debate at the Somerville Media Center among candidates for state representative. These forums are sponsored by Somerville Stands Together and Our Revolution Somerville. The forums will be live streamed on Facebook and by the Somerville Media Center, so check your local listings for rebroadcast times in July and August. Just Us Somerville has joined us as a third sponsor. And uh, this is the third and final debate of this particular series. Please meet the candidates for 34th Middlesex State Representative Race, Christine Barber and Anna Callahan. So, no candidate has advanced knowledge of the questions. Candidate opening statements, closing statements, and primary question responses will be limited to two minutes each. I will have discretion to ask short, short follow-up questions and candidate responses to follow-up questions will be limited to one minute. I will alert the candidates when their time has expired and candidates are asked to respect the time limits so that we can all get to all of the questions that have been prepared. Candidates should follow moderator instructions and should not each other, interrupt each other and me. So candidates, you both have two minutes each for opening statements. Could we start with Representative Barber? Sure, thanks Kat. Um, I wanna thank you for having me here as well as the Somerville Media Center and all the sponsors. It's, um, I'm really grateful to be here and speak with voters and all of you about my reelection campaign and what I'm working on. So my name is Christine Barber and I'm proud to be the state representative for neighborhoods in Somerville and Medford. I'm a progressive activist and I first ran for office at the city level because my neighborhood of Winter Hill was being ignored and not well represented. Um, as I'm running for re-election, I've served as state rep since 2015. And in that time, I've really worked closely with people in the community to pass legislation that brings about progressive change. Before I ran for office, I was a healthcare advocate. I worked on policy change to expand access to healthcare. Um, at the state and national levels. And my work at the State House has been driven by my passion for social justice, my commitment for supporting families and in the community. Um, at the State House, I've worked to protect affordable health care, climate change, create more affordable housing, fight for equality for women. These are incredibly challenging times. The inequality and racism that has come to light and been present for so long has finally been exposed. There's so much to do. There's lots of things that I'm working on and we need to work together to create greater equity and justice in our communities. So in my experience, the way to make meaningful change is to listen to people in the community, those most impacted and amplify their voices to make positive change. That's something I've done. I've worked with immigrant, on immigrants' rights, on workers' protections, on how the climate crisis is affecting our local community. I'm looking forward to the, to the conversation tonight and talking more about all of these issues. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Callahan. Thank you. Um, I wanna thank all of the organizations that have made this happen. Thank you so much. Also, Representative Barber, thank you for being here and thank you for the service that you've done with our, for our community. Uh, my name is Anna Callahan. I am a software engineer and mom and I've lived here since 2003. Uh, I, in 2016, I quit my job. Uh, it was originally to volunteer for the Bernie Sanders campaign, uh, but after that, I never went back because I realized that we are at an all hands on deck moment in politics. I started an organization um, called The Incorruptibles with a mission of filling all levels of government with people, progressives who represent us instead of the wealthy. Um, and I have spent my last four years training people across the country in Oklahoma and Kansas and California and Washington and right here in Massachusetts uh, to elect slates of candidates by, um, to their city council mostly, um, by building coalitions of underserved communities and increasing the engagement of working people. Now in Massachusetts, uh, we are ready for bold action on climate change. We are ready to overhaul our criminal justice system. Um, and certainly in this district, we're ready to recognize housing as a human right. Um, the thing that is preventing us is concentration of power uh, in the state house uh, in the hands of the speaker. 
So this election is really about good government. This election is about whether our state reps' votes are secret or public. This election is about whether legislators have even 30 minutes to review uh, an amendment before they have to vote on it. Um, and it's fundamentally about the concentration of power in the hands of the speaker that prevents us from passing progressive policies. Thank you very much. We have six questions now prepared and then a lightning round. We're going to alternate who speaks first and then you have two minutes each for each question. So to start with healthcare and to you, Ms. Callahan, uh, healthcare, do you support a public single payer health insurance system for Massachusetts that would replace private employer provided plans? If you do, how does that work? And if you don't, are there health care reforms that you propose? Yes, I definitely support a single payer health plan. Um, it is one of the reasons I was attracted to the Bernie Sanders campaign in the first place. Um, you know, I grew up, my mom is from Europe. I grew up with the understanding that every other major nation on earth can make this happen. And so can we. So um, I am, I, I know there's already a bill that Representative uh, Sabadosa has in the house. Um, it is an excellent bill. Uh, it will guarantee health care to all the residents of Massachusetts with no co-pays, no deductibles. It would cover all medically necessary care, um, including dental and vision and hearing aids. Um, the, it would also be budget neutral, um, and it would ensure that any new taxes um, from residents of Massachusetts would be uh, less than the amount that they are paying uh, already for those copays and deductibles. Um, so it is a great bill. And I think what we need to do is to do what uh, Representative Sabadoza has asked us to do, which is to uh, engage people in our district around this issue. So this is really a question of engaging people in the political process, um, we've made progress on Medicare for All over the last four years because of personal stories about how the medical system and medical debt crushes people, with personal stories about people whose family members have died because they simply could not afford health care. Um, and that is, I believe, the role of the elected official is to go into the community to listen to those personal stories, to uplift those personal stories, because that is what engages people to get involved. Um, the people of Massachusetts want it, we're ready for it. It does continue to get stalled in committee because of the concentration of power, but uh, I definitely am for it. All right, Rep Barber, same question. Thanks, Kat. So I am a co-sponsor of the Medicare for All bill, and I have worked with the sponsors um, on moving that forward. Um, Healthcare has been um, a career long um, issue, struggle that I have worked on. Um, and I support healthcare as a human right. Um, the way that um, there are many ways that I've been working on this to actually bring it to fruition. So, right now, while the Medicare for All bill is strong, it is honestly not implementable with Trump as president. Uh, healthcare is a, is a place that the state has to partner with the federal government. And there are strides we can make at the state level to get ready for, God willing, uh, the next um, <laughs> president. Um, but we um, need to work on other things as well. So I'm working on Medicare for All. I've also drafted a bill this session um, on mass health buy-in to continue to expand mass health to get the state ready um, to so that uh, more and more people can buy into Medicaid, even if they're not low income, they can we can expand that pool and get to a place where single payer is easier to actually implement in a few years. I've also led the charge. Uh, the governor, Governor Baker, tried to cut 140,000 people off of Mass Health, low income parents off of Mass Health last year. I led the charge to prevent that. We are in a time when there are constantly threats of cuts and we are still holding on. There is so much we need to do to get to healthcare for all and I am in this fight and will continue to be. Thank you very much. Now we move on to housing. The Commonwealth's eviction moratorium expires at the end of August. Is housing a right for all? And what policy reforms will protect tenants? 
for you, Rep. Barber. Thank you. I was so proud to work on, support, and vote for the uh, eviction moratorium. I'm on the housing committee. I worked hard to get that bill out of committee. And I'm so proud of my colleague, Mike Connolly, who drafted the eviction moratorium. That is the strongest um, eviction moratorium bill in the country and um, has prevented countless people from being kicked out of their houses during an, an epidemic. Um, the challenge now is what comes next. We know that rent has been building up for the past few months. Um, people are scared. As we begin to reopen, what is gonna happen um, when people are out of work and really in crisis? So I've been working with Rep Connolly and members of the housing committee on another bill to say, well, what's phase two? Some of that is rental assistance and making sure that there's a backup for people who can't pay rent. Um, and there are some other ways that we can make sure that people aren't being evicted because of this crisis. Um, and that's something we can get done. That's something that um, we're looking at to do this session and I am um, committed to working on it. Thank you. Ms. Callahan, same, same question. Sure. Um, I talked to a constituent who is being evicted right now. Um, she, she doesn't have the wherewithal to fight it legally. Um, so if we had uh, mortgage and rent cancellation, um, that would really help, especially in a district that has so many people with roommates. Um, you have one roommate who can't pay their rent and the other three roommates, they are also, um, they are now gonna be in, in financial trouble. Um, as far as um, making housing a human right, um, I think there are things that we can do, broader, more structural changes that we can make that will really move us forward. Um, I very much am in favor of um, the Somerville Community Land Trust. That is a wonderful, long-term, permanent, affordable housing measure that I think we should have a lot more of across the state. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, Public banking can play into that as well to provide funding from the state. Uh, and another thing that I think would really help us with gentrification, um, as well as uh, just with you know, rental prices uh, and housing prices, is uh, to provide social housing. And social housing is a little bit different from public housing. Social housing is designed to be mixed income levels. Uh, so it, it doesn't force people out once they uh, reach a certain income level. Um, it's designed for people to stay in for a very long time, maybe forever. Um, and when you provide social housing, uh, what that means is that uh, there's less pressure from the market. Uh, and so the market doesn't completely control the price of housing. Um, I would love to work on uh, policies like that that are sort of broader, big picture uh, questions around providing housing for everyone. Thank you very much. And again to you. The environment. Somerville and Medford are no strangers to climate issues. What state level legislation, what many are calling the Massachusetts Green New Deal, well, what specific action would you take immediately next session to advance a Green New Deal based on these values? Sure. Um, I was early uh, to, like, to climate change um, and the importance. I was a zero waster back in the 90s when I graduated from college. Um, it's very important to me. I think the first, one thing to realize is that every time we turn around, scientists are saying, oh, actually we were wrong. Climate change is way worse than we thought. So um, we need to look at everything through a lens of environmental justice. Um, we, the Green Justice Coalition has the right idea, which is to put together um, Com marginalized communities of color that are most impacted by climate change with labor and environmental groups. And that is how we develop a Green New Deal. Um, we have to commit to sourcing our electricity from 100% renewables by 2035 at the latest. We have to divest from fossil fuels. Uh, we have to uh, convert you know, government transportation uh, to electric. We have to uh, have make sure that all new housing uh, is passive housing. Um, is zero emissions housing. But more than that, we are eventually going to have to have a plan for how are we going to switch our private transportation to electric? How are we gonna retrofit all of our housing and commercial buildings um, so that they are not uh, also emitting um, carbon emissions? And so it's a very complex problem 
Uh, and again, the way we go about it is through a coalition of groups that really centralizes um, the, the voices of the people most impacted by climate change. Um, and you know, I, I really wanna say that the people of Massachusetts are totally ready for this in every poll, willing to pay extra money for it. The legislature is not ready. Uh, we have to get rid of the concentration of power um, and the stranglehold that the speaker has over the state house because that's how we can get this done. All right, Rep. Barbara, how about you and the Massachusetts Green New Deal? What happens next session? The climate crisis is an incredibly um, critical piece that we need to be working on right now. We are late. We need to get to the table and start doing so many p things to move this forward. Um, what strikes me most is in talking to people in my community. Um, so my constituents, particularly people who live in the Mystic Public Housing situated living hundreds of people right next to I-93. Um, and there's been some organizing to try to put up sound barriers there. Of course, there aren't sound barriers along the Mystic Housing. Those were not deemed um, necessary when 93 went in, um, in the 60s. And uh, we've actually worked with some great uh, scientists and community organizers on those issues. And it turns out the sound barriers may not even work there. And we were looking at air filtration and other ways to close up their housing um, to try to make it a safer area. And to me, and the work that um, the residents have done there, that really speaks to what's facing us. Uh, we know there's higher rates of asthma. We know there's worse cardiovascular outcomes. And that's directly due to the pollution coming from I-93 and, and mainly hitting low-income neighborhoods really nearby. Um, so that is something I'm working with them on, trying to figure out solutions. Um, more broadly, of course, we need to convert our transportation um, to um, non-fossil fuel manners. Um, I actually sponsor, I'm the lead sponsor of one of the pieces of the Green New Deal <laughs> that is about converting all of our fleets um, to zero emission vehicles. So it's about converting both municipal fleets and private fleets um, to become zero emission um, over the next uh, 15 years. And we have a way to ratchet that down um, through incentives and um, requirements. It is um, a plan that can work and that's something that I've um, been working on moving. I'm strongly committed to 100% renewable energy, um, working with my colleagues on moving that forward. Um, so that's my time. Um, there's lots to do there, I guess, is to say. All right. Thank you very much for being respectful of the time. Uh, next question, and it's the big one. Um, and it's, it's the elephant in the room because these are three white women talking to each other on screen. Systemic racism. We've had 401 years of slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, mass incarceration, and violent policing of black communities. Racism has been a consistent thread woven through the fabric of America. So how will race and culture inform how you work with your constituents? Rep. Barbara first. Thanks, Kat. Right now, there, um, I'm so heartened to see all the protests and so many movements, especially in Somerville and Medford. I've been so, to so many rallies and seen so much activity virtually and in person in safe ways. And um, I'm glad to see so much activity around this issue and so much um, greater awareness paid to white supremacy and racism and the huge challenges that face all of us. Um, what I've been doing is listening to and talking with particularly people of color in the community, um, leaders of color, others um, who have really been affected by, by systemic racism, by police, police brutality, and trying to listen to them about what are the things that we need to be doing. So at the state level, I'm taking the lead of the Black and Latino Caucus. Um, they came out pretty quickly with a 10-point plan about ways, about things that we need to do now to start to address systemic racism, police brutality, and the criminal justice system and um, the racism of, of prisons. And I have been working closely with my colleagues in the Black and Latino Caucus. They have some really strong bills that we are moving on right now um, on you know, decertifying police officers, um, 
removing qualified immunity and um, a strong bill by my colleague Liz Miranda about police use of force and limiting eliminating tear gas and chokeholds and no knock warrants and things that should have been eliminated long ago that we need to do now. So I am proud to elevate and support the work that they are doing. Thank you, Ms. Callahan. How will race and culture inform how you work with your constituents? Yes. Um, so. Uh, a little story first, in 2000, um, in the year 2000, I was arrested uh, while peacefully protesting um, and I was, uh, I spent two nights in jail. Um, and what was painfully clear to me at that time was how different, how whatever happened to me was nothing compared to what was happening to people of color in the same situation. Um, and since then, I have, I have really been very concerned about policing, about incarceration, about racism. Um, one of the, you know, I, in all this training that I've done, one of the number one things to do is to list out who are all the vulnerable, marginalized people that are in your district. Reach out to those people, find people in those communities. So one of the first things that I did was to, to try to make my best effort to find people in the Haitian community. Um, and I, um, I now have a, a nice um, uh, relationship with someone who said that when her family originally arrived in Somerville in the 70s, um, they have stories that are, are truly horrible. Um, we all are part of this culture. Um, and what I have done to try and undo that in my workshops that I've done over the last four years, um, I incorporated a piece on police brutality. Um, and I presented this workshop uh, whether people wanted to hear it or not, right? So this is something that I have done to raise the issue of racism. And the reason I did it was specifically because I wanted to make it painfully clear to others that they must have uh, members of uh, the black community and other communities of color in their coalition at the decision-making table before they decide on policy. And that is what I will do. All right, thank you very much. And you get the next question. This is on transparency and accountability. Many bills with large numbers of co-sponsors never get a floor vote session after session. What would you do differently to help ensure that needed progressive legislation actually gets passed? Sure. Um, so uh, I think all the voters know that this election, it, there, there are two choices. It's not just about me. Um, it is about the comparison between two people. And, and on this one issue, um, I, I feel that it's uh, my responsibility to talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the record of the incumbent, uh, Representative Barber. Now, Rep Barber and I agree on many progressive issues uh, in our support for unions, for the LGBTQ community, for immigrants, but on the topic of transparency um, and the concentration of power in the hands of the speaker, uh, her voting record is very clear. Um, if you look at all of the public votes that have happened while she has been in office, um, Representative Barber has voted uh, in favor of more power for the speaker and to reduce transparency every time. Um, she voted to uh, eliminate uh, term limits for the speaker. Uh, she voted that committee votes should not be made public. She voted that even committee votes that are public should not be put on the website. She voted to not even allow uh, representatives 30 minutes to read through an amendment before a vote, to not allow 24 hours to read through a bill on committee. Um, these are all things that are very important to me. Um, I have helped pass public financing of elections in, uh, in other cities. And good government is necessary if we're going to pass any of the progressive policies that the two of us both believe in. Um, this is the issue of the election cycle because it really is a difference between the two of us. Um, and I will make sure that we reduce the power of the speaker and that we have transparency uh, in every vote that I have. Thank you, Rep. Barber, your response. Thanks, Kat. Um, I appreciate the question and I do, I would like to clear this up because I think there's um, been some, um, I would like to get some more information out. Um, 
I am supportive of transparency. All of my votes are public um, and all of my committee votes um, are public. There's a, some of the votes that were just mentioned um, on transparency and having um, time to read uh, legislation actually came up. They were filed with less than a day notice and no conversation or organizing. So I didn't feel that they were done in a way uh, that was actually trying to get to a place of transparency. And I'm working with some of my colleagues right now to actually um, work on some meaningful rules reform that we can actually win and work on in a long-term way. Um, so this is very important to me and something that I am working on. I do think it is a way to help us get more progressive things passed. And that is why I'm in the legislature, is to pass progressive policies. Um, I've worked for the last two years, two years really closely with an immigrant-led coalition um, working to make sure that anyone can get a driver's license regardless of their uh, immigration status. Because right now people are driving and they're afraid they're gonna get deported or detained. That is a bill um, that we are continuing to build support for. We are still working to get the votes. We do not have enough progressive legislators in Massachusetts. I spend lots of time trying to get people elected in Andover and in Attleboro and in Lemonster who are progressive. And that's something that, that hasn't happened before. Um, we have work to do to build our caucus, to organize, and to make sure that we have enough votes to pass these things. There's a lot of really great progressive ideas out there, and we need to make sure we have people who are ready to stand up and vote for them, and that's the work I'm doing. Thank you very much. The next question that we have is on jobs. The pandemic has forced many workers to choose between health and feeding their families. We have the horrible combination of weak federal safety enforcement and low wages, and this will affect your future constituents of color and immigrant workers the most. What do you do to address this crisis? Rep. Barber. The COVID pandemic has really um, exposed what a lot of us knew was a crisis, that there isn't a safety net for low-income workers, for families, uh, for immigrants, for so many people. Um, that is something that I've been working on much before this pandemic. But of course, now with the current economic situation, um, it, it, there are so many families in crisis. My office has done um, dozens and dozens of unemployment cases because our system is so challenging for people to use that it, they, they are, have been looking for help in getting unemployment, food access, a housing, healthcare, really basic needs that should be available. Um, I've done a lot of work, especially with healthcare, working with health, low, lower wage healthcare workers and early education workers. These are people who are do or on the front lines. They're caring for our family members, our children, and they are paid incredibly low wages. We have so much work to do to invest in them and make sure that. Um, that they're getting the support and the, the, the funding that they need. Right now, that's PPE. Um, I have been fighting to get um, social workers, child care workers, uh, health care workers. There's so many people who don't have enough protective equipment, just the basic safety. Um, and there's, there's a lot we need to do to ensure that that is there for them. So um, I'm a co-sponsor of an emergency paid sick time bill. Um, we are working to pass that soon. Um, we've shored up unemployment and been able to um, provide some more benefits to workers and some hazard pay to workers who have been doing the really essential work for the last few months. Um, but those, these are not new issues and these are workforces that we really need to support long term and, um, and work on a vision to do that. All right, thank you. Ms. Callahan, you're next. Sure. Um, so I, uh, I have a, a lawyer interview people um, from, the, from the district um, in the area about their lives and how COVID is affecting their lives. I had a musician on from here um, to talk about how he had lost his uh, restaurant job and also his musician jobs. And at the same time, I had a musician friend of mine from Canada where she's being paid $2,000 a month and has all of her medical care covered. Um, so other countries are managing to do this in a way that does not 
create what we have. What we're quickly careening towards is a dual society where um, people with white collar jobs uh, are staying home, they're safe, they can work from home, uh, they have their groceries delivered, and then there's people who have lower income who either have lost their jobs or have to risk their health in order to be able to pay their rent. This is on top of the inequality that we had before COVID, which was the highest since 1929. So a lot of this has to do with deep-seated inequality. We have to make the wealthy pay their fair share so that we can provide social safety nets. Um, so we need Medicare for all, especially during a pandemic. It's a little bit crazy that we don't have that. Um, we have to make sure that we continue to provide unemployment benefits. Um, we have to make sure that uh, we pay a minimum wage immediately, not delayed the way the grand bargain was, but like right, we should have let the ballot measure happen for that. We should have, you know, time and a half on Sundays and the things that we lost in the grand bargain. Um, and I finally want to say something about unions because um, I really think that unions are the core of how we build jobs. Um, and my labor policies are going to be determined in coalition with unions, not just advice, but strategizing together what our priorities are and how we are going to get those things passed through the state house. All right, thank you very much. We are now moving on to the lightning round. Um, basically, this is a yes or no, um, this is yes or no answers. Uh, we'll move on and we're going to do, well, I'm going to do my best to switch off back and forth to make sure that uh, everybody gets a chance to go first. Um, so to start with you, Ms. Callahan, the Roe Act, which would expand access to abortion, ensuring that anyone, regardless of age, income, insurance, can access safe legal abortion here in Massachusetts, yes or no? Yes. Rep. Barber. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. In agreement. So the Safe Communities Act, and Rep. Barber, you answer first. The Safe Communities Act, which among other things, would limit state and local law enforcement cooperation with ICE and keep state tax dollars from supporting federal immigration law enforcement. Rep. Barber, yes or no? Yes, enthusiastically. Ms. Callahan. Absolutely, yes. All right, everybody's in agreement so far. All right, the Fair Share Amendment, Ms. Callahan, would raise revenue by taxing a portion of a person's annual income above $1 million, yes or no? Yes. All right, Rep. Barber? Yes, I voted for it three times, yes. All right. Okay, then to you, Rep. Barber, extending in-state tuition to all Massachusetts high school graduates, regardless of documentation status. Go Highlanders. Yes or no? Definitely yes. Ms. Callahan? Yes, absolutely. All right. Uh, the last one I have here is a ban on construction for you, Ms. Callahan, a ban on construction of any new fossil fuel infrastructure and removing all fares on public transportation. Yes and yes to both. All right, Rep. Barber? Yes and yes. All right, well, we had agreement in the lightning round. So, uh we have a little extra time here so i'm going to ask an extra question what is the biggest point and i i will ask for two minutes uh on this uh on this particular question what is the biggest point that different differentiates you miss callahan from your opponent uh, sure. I, I think I probably already said it, but I'll say it again. Um, I think the right now um, the Massachusetts Democratic Party platform is very progressive. It is essentially the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren platform. Um, and it is very popular in the district. Um, we, can, we have a super majority, a veto proof, proof super majority of Democrats in the House and Senate, and we cannot pass Medicare for all. We cannot pass uh, real climate change legislation. We can't, pa we can't pass any of the things that are in that document. And it's because there is 
a concentration of power in the hands of the speaker. Um, and that is the big difference between the two of us. Um, Representative Barber voted to end term limits for the speaker. I would vote to have term limits. She voted to increase the pay for the speaker and the pay for all of the committee chairs and co-chairs that the, that the speaker alone chooses. I think that the speaker should not be choosing those. I think they should be chosen by a secret vote on the, the, for, the for the entire house. Um, she voted against transparency, like uh, making committee votes public, um, making uh, committee votes that are public, putting them on the website, all of that stuff. We need transparency everywhere. In fact, we actually need for our legislature to no longer be exempt from public records law. We are one of only two states in the country where all three branches of government are exempt from public records law, and that is ridiculous. Um, the lack of transparency, the lack of time for legislators to look at bills means that we can't organize as activists around those bills either. And this whole situation, the culture, the rules, the financial incentives, prevents us from passing progressive policies, prevents us from passing the Massachusetts Democratic Party platform. Um, and I will work very hard to end that. All right, thank you very much. Rep Barber, what differentiates you from your opponent? Thanks, Kat. Um, I, I actually think um, there are some other differences. So I, as you can see, um, my opponent and I agree on a lot of on a lot of the, the issues broadly. Um, and I think what separates us is experience. So I've spent my entire career working to pass progressive policy change. Um, my uh, first job out of college, I did community organizing, working with low-income women. It was right after welfare reform, and it was such a welfare reform in quotes, such a broken system that um, was really impacting women and hindering their ability to support their families and get the basic support they need to go to school and um, make sure that they could support their families. And in hearing their stories and working with them, it's really what inspired me to um to work in policy and to start to um learn more about how legislation worked about how we could um, work together in coalition and actually get things changed and get things passed um, and i've spent my career um whether it be healthcare advocacy or working on uh welfare rights um working on affordable housing um i've spent my career understanding how to work with people on the ground listen to their experiences, and then try to organize and get things changed at the policy level. Um, and that is, that's the work that I, I love doing. Um, I have, uh, I'm so incredibly grateful for all of the people who I've met along the way in doing that. And that is the work that I want to continue to do. All right, well, thank you. So while our candidates uh, prepare for closing statements of two minutes each, I just want to thank Justice Somerville, Somerville Stands Together and Our Revolution Somerville, who prepared the questions and are sponsoring this debate. Um, may I start with you, Rep. Barber, your closing statement? Sure, so I wanna start by thanking all the organizations. Um, I wanna thank Anna for being here tonight and engaging. Um, and I wanna thank Kat, of course, for, for moderating um, and coming back to Somerville to do this. So I wanna take a moment and say what I know is true, that showing up and working alongside members of Somerville and Medford community on progressive legislation to combat some of the systemic issues that are facing us, issues like racism, access to healthcare, housing, poverty, no one is going to fight harder or dig deeper into these progressive issues than I will. When COVID-19 hit, um, it was a harrowing time with the public health emergency. Um, but as a public health professional and a public servant, I jumped in um, to get creative about how to reach out to constituents. I ran a phone program to check in on seniors to see what they needed. Um, we reached over 1,800 people in a couple weeks. And we learned so much from them about their needs, about resilience. And I'm really, I was really glad to talk to, to so many people. Um, I heard from communities of immigrants who couldn't get access to basic resources like unemployment and the economic stimulus payments. We were able to push the Division of Unemployment to actually translate their application and put a number of languages on their online portal to make sure people can get the benefits that they're entitled to. 
when the availability of free breakfast and free lunch was at risk in Somerville and Medford and all over the state, I organized a sign-on letter with my colleagues to the USDA, who was threatening to pull back on those programs, and we won. And now kids we're, can get fed through the summer, and I'm proud of that work. And with all of our crises at the state and local level on the budget, I filed a bill to raise progressive revenue by taxing profits that large corporations are hiding in offshore accounts because we're gonna to have to, decisions to make. These are huge economic um, crises right now and we're gonna be deciding, do we tax wealthy corporations or fire teachers? And I'd rather tax wealthy corporations. Thank I know we're out of time. Can I, 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 we've got a lot accomplished and we have so much more to do. Join our efforts to continue working on justice and equity in Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rep. Barber. Ms. Callahan, your closing statement. Sure. I have a quote on my wall that I look at every day uh, because it, it has driven almost everything I've done for the last four years and it drives me to run for office today. Um, and it says, if they have the money and we have the people, we cannot win by preaching to the choir. So we need to engage people in the political process. We need to engage a lot more people in the political process than we are. When more people are engaged, progressive policies win. Elected officials have a unique position and a unique ability to engage people in the process. Um, it is something that I've you know, worked with a lot of experts on, people who have done this a lot. Um, and I've developed training programs, I've trained people all over. Um, it is something that if our elected officials are not doing that job. If they're not reaching into the community, not just the, the, the grass tops, the, the leaders of, uh, of organizations or the leaders of communities, but going into that community and listening, hearing personal stories, uplifting those personal stories um, to then engage the rest of the community, we're missing out on the way that we're gonna win progressive policy, right? Move, we've got to build the movement. That is how we're gonna get a Green New Deal is by building the movement. It's kind of how we're gonna get Medicare for all single payer in Massachusetts is by building the movement. Um, so the, we also, of course, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, we are um, prevented from doing these things by the concentration of power in the hands of the speaker and by lack of transparency. Um, but I, I really look forward to bringing people into the political process to be part of a style of co-governance where um, Together, we strategize how we can get these things accomplished. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. This has been a very educational debate for me. Uh, it is always interesting to hear how people in and around Somerville often agree so much on everything. Um, I want to thank our candidates for sharing their views tonight. Thank Do you. know that the state primary is Tuesday? September 1, 2020, which means the last day to register to vote is Wednesday, August 12, 2020. I hope you all register to vote. I hope you all stay engaged. For the Somerville Media Center, I'm Kat Powers. Good night.